Uh, we will be presenting our risk management program. It's our renewal for our liability and workers comp uh, program. And of course, we, um, we uh, consult with the, the Arthur Gallagher Group to pr uh, provide us with information about our program. And today we have Jory Vandervoort and Tony Ambella Jr. here that will present the details in detail. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Jory. Great, thank you. Thank you. And good morning. Um, again, my name is Jory Vandervoort. Um, I've brought my our director of education and public sector business, Tony Ambella Jr. He has worked on your account um, in the past along with me as well as a number of our other educational clients uh, in Florida and you know, certainly with your neighbor with the Duval County School Board. So he has a wealth of information and an interesting perspective on things as well. But you know, first and foremost, we certainly appreciate having the opportunity to come and do a more detailed uh, workshop for you. This is really our preferred method to do so as it really, you know, you can really dive into the nuts and bolts as opposed to trying to jump through uh, our presentation as I did a few weeks ago. So with that said, what I've gone ahead and done today is we put together uh, a PowerPoint that tries to, you know, dive deeper into just insurance programs in general, where you can sort of see where you fit into the types of insurance programs that are available. We'll talk about some of the loss history. Um, we'll go into your program specifically and then the conclusion. I've put together this PowerPoint that you can certainly ask me questions throughout it. You know, certainly please don't wait to the end and welcome those questions. So just a, you know, a fairly quick blurb on Gallagher. Some of you know us, some of you don't. We are certainly from a the K-12 standpoint, one of the, the world's largest insurance brokers encompassing public, private, uh, charter schools, things of that nature. We're one of the largest in Florida. We've been doing uh, educational business in Florida since 1977. We have over 100 educational clients alone just in Florida. We have 300 um, plus sales staff um, just, uh, you know, throughout the country and, you know, a little bit, you know, our, your peers are, are our clients. I'm showing you the uh, individual Florida school systems that we do. We also are the broker for a couple different pools that have a lot of your different neighbors. And then, you know, I hate these types of slides because I always feel like it's an advertisement for our company. And so I look at it and say, well, what does it really mean to you? And what it means to you to be able to see these types of statistics and to see these types of clients, it tells you <coughs> that we know your business, we have market relationships, we're able to really structure programs and customize programs specifically to, to meet your needs. So, as I mentioned, we wanted to do an insurance overview. You know, because we talk about different self-insured retentions, we talk about excess insurance, and you know, when we met a few weeks ago, we were just looking at Clay Schools and where you're at, but I think I wanted what I thought was best to you know give us a, a broader perspective on where you fit into that type of insurance program because you know we all you know you might have homeowners insurance you're familiar with health insurance you're you can be familiar with commercial insurance but there's a lot of different types of products and programs that cross that spectrum of uh, insurance and risk management and so when we look at it there's some you start on the left side of this. Um, chart and we call that the less control if you look at that first um, item there we call that the conventional insurance and that's what is called first dollar insurance so the insurance company rates your program charges money they charge money for the premium and the premium is going to include charges for their overhead for their claims administration for the expected cost of your claims you're going to pay all that money in on the first day of the program and when you have claims they're going to settle the claims do what they want with the claims and really not seek a whole lot of input from you because <coughs> they view it as being their money so that's conventional insurance and we say that that is less control our what we like our clients to do is really we promote taking greater control of your insurance program where you're actually going to take retentions take deductibles manage those claims within those retentions by ultimately buying the least amount of insurance possible that's what we want for you 
we don't want you to be handing monies off to the insurance companies. So as you move along that spectrum, you have safety dividend type programs. Those are programs where you still pay in the money up front. When the policy period ends, you wait you know, another year, year and a half, and if you've had some good loss control, the insurance company would give you some money back, you know, a small percentage of premium back. The same type of um, philosophy with the large deductible retro program is the same type of thing. You're just moving, you're taking on a, a larger deductible, whether it's $25,000, $50,000. You get to the middle of this spectrum, this continuum, and there's two areas. There's protected self-insurance and specific excess insurance. I've shown you where Clay County School fits on that. But a large portion of our clients fit in that middle category there, the, the protected self-insurance and the specific excess insurance. So when you talk about the protected self-insurance, what that actually means is that you would, and I'll, I have some further charts along in this uh, presentation, but basically where you would cap the number of self-insured retentions that you pay out in a given year. So you ultimately stop paying self-insured retentions. You've actually moved along further in the control continuum and you've been able to do that because you have some very good loss experience. You have good quality staff, people that are helping to manage the claims. You've hired very good service providers. So you've moved over into the excess, we call it specific excess, so there's no aggregate protection for you. You're paying those self-insured retentions each and every time. But once you, when you actually look at the uh, loss experience, you'll see that you can do that. In the past, you've had a pretty high tolerance for risk, meaning you're, you have, you're not adverse to taking retentions. Okay, can you explain the difference between aggregate protection and no aggregate? Yeah, and I'm going to get okay. to that uh, in, a, in a couple slides if you'll just bear with yep. me because we go into more detail on these, but I wanted to just give a few um, definitions here. The rent-a-captive and the captives, we really don't see our public sector, educational sector clients doing that. That's more for private commercial type businesses that create their own insurance companies per se. They have tax advantages and obviously as a governmental entity those tax advantages don't really resound with us. And then you get all the way to the other end of the spectrum, taking the ultimate control and purely self-insuring, meaning you're just not going to buy any insurance. We don't have any clients that don't buy any insurance, but we do have clients that say for certain lines of coverage they're not going to buy insurance. So we have certain school boards that don't buy excess workers' compensation or they rely solely on sovereign immunity and don't buy uh, liability coverages as well. So you can certainly move along that spectrum and not have to be completely self-insured, but where you can sort of pick and choose depending on how comfortable you are with your loss experience with your team of folks that are managing those losses. So I talked a little bit about, you know, when we go back, just looking, and I probably already touched on this, but that first uh, item, which is the conventional insurance, we talked about, um, you know, it's the first dollar. It responds to the losses from dollar one. As soon as the loss happens, the insurance company takes over, assigns their adjuster, handles the claim, manages the claim, does all the contact with the uh, injured party. They view the premium dollars as their money, and they pay those claims out. The, at, at their leisure and they have the ultimate uh, final disposition of the claim. And then one of the keys, and you'll see it, one of the keys to doing this protected self-insurance and even self-insurance, the insurance companies earn investment income on your money where they're aware while claims are waiting to be paid. That's a huge, you'll see that you have a huge cash flow advantage by being in the type of program that you are because what you're doing is you're paying your fixed costs, you're paying some insurance premiums, and you're keeping the loss funds, you're keeping those at the school board and you pay those losses over time. So getting to your question about, you know, the, the what are some of the basic elements? So let me stand up here for a second. So we have the self-insured retention, which is this green box. And this is where you have different items, whether it be $100,000, $250,000. These are your self-insured retention. Above it, you're buying insurance up above each and every self-insured retention. That's specific excess insurance. 
Now the other piece of it, when we were asking about an aggregate versus no aggregate. So every time, if you buy this, what we call aggregate coverage, you can set up a loss fund. There's a loss fund that's determined by the insurance carriers. And they look at <coughs> historical losses, exposures. Um, you know, it's pretty much an actuarially determined number. And they say, you know, in a given year, we expect that the Clay County School Board in that policy year could have, let's say, and we have a, we actually have an option for it, but they say we could expect that, you know, the loss funds would be somewhere around 1.7 million. So if you ended up paying all, each and every one of those self-insured retentions all the way up to the $1.7 million, once you exhaust your loss fund, you can, you would be paying a premium for this insurance. This is the insurance right here. And it's a million dollars that actually drops in and starts paying those self-insured retentions for you. So the difference between, let me go back. So the difference between being in protected self-insurance between the excess, specific excess is that aggregate extra million dollars of insurance that you can buy. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. I'll bet that. <laughs> and, and we don't, and obviously, past, we don't have that. In the past, you did. Yeah. In the past, you did. You had that at, at some point. And what you found was that you were actually doing a really good job of controlling your losses. And the number, the sort of actuarially determined number from the insurance company, was coming in higher than what you believed your number would be. So we, we you were beating the actuary. You were beating by the actuary, bit. which is great, which is great. And so you elected to save because I actually we have a quote for it. It would have, this year they've given us a number and they say okay it would be 1.7 million dollars for the loss fund. If you want to buy this insurance up here, that's 18 thousand dollars. So if we just use those numbers historically speaking, it, let's say the 1.7 was higher than where you had been doing it, because when you looked at it, you were saying, well, we think it'd be around 1.2 million. It didn't make sense for you to spend the extra $18,000 for insurance protection that you weren't using. Your, your annual losses over the last seven, eight years have run between $500,000 and 1.3 million. So you haven't approached that 1.7 in any year. So while we have, like I mentioned, we have a quote that we could buy, we could buy this layer and feel protected and say, we know that at some point we're going to stop paying our self-insured retentions. We can buy that this year for, I'd have to double check, I think $18,000. But the reality of it is the number here that they're trying to determine seems too, too high from where your yeah. historical losses are showing. And that's, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing for you in that you've moved further along that control continuum. You don't need the aggregate protection. But it's, if I may, it's costing us, what did you just say over the last seven years? Uh, we've, we've paid between 500,000 and about 1.3 billion in claims in, at any given we've year. We've paid that. That comes out of the That school. comes out of our budget. Correct. That, that's and the loss experience that we see in this. Yeah. Right. Correct. And so yes. for $18,000, we would then not have to pay out that amount of money. No, you that would be insurance. covered. No, you would be paying that. You still pay that. You still pay that. Let's, still let's pay say, the let's say, percent. even though. Got it. Thank you. That's what I was confused about. Three went over to yeah. over one even though we have some years that so were 500,000. So it has to be over 1.7 yeah. in order for us it, to do that. It, so you it, are. Thanks. 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 Sure. So that's, that's, that's why I was saying that it would make sense for us to buy that insurance. We call it sleep insurance, but the target is so far away that it just doesn't make sense for I don't really see why you would want to spend $18,000 for it. And that's why you were able to do away with it a few years back. 
Thank you for explaining that. <laughs> yes, because I was confused by that. That was okay. yeah, no, and the, that's this why I like these where workshops where we can sit down and really get through the, the nitty gritty. It's easier for us to understand it. Yeah, hold on. You know what? We don't reach one. Okay, go ahead. So, so Jory, okay. let's have one person speak at a time. This here, right, is an actuary, you know, anticipating. Yes. Right? And you're saying that we, we beat the actuary, so why do we, why should we have purchased it? We did away with this excess insurance. But this loss fund, is it safe to say that that, you know, comparing it to this that you all saw? Is it, is it safe to say that this is made up of your self-insured retention money? Correct. Yes. That's exactly, exactly, that's exactly, exactly that how the dynamic exactly works. exactly where it comes from. Okay. I want everyone to understand. And, and, and again, and just, and just, so what the actuaries are saying is we have to be, we're on the hook for a million dollars if we blow through. Mm -hmm. we, if we're collecting $18,000 a year, we're going to have to collect that for about 35 years, 40 years to make up for that full million. So they're setting that attachment where it's not going to happen, but in a very odd year, so that indeed they're banking enough money through those aggregate stop losses to be able to pay for the ones that actually hit. Mm -hmm. okay. So in simple terms, from an insurance person just at home buying her car insurance, the 1.7 is your deductible. Right. It would be it an is, annual aggregate deductible. Right. Yeah. So if you had a bunch yeah. of kids that were smashing up cars, which I have at home, yeah. and you could buy that, it would be a good buy. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Oh, no. That's like So now, this is where this is where we're at. We're the specific excess insurance on that control continuum. And so we just want to look at what are some of the costs that are associated with that uh, type of program. So you have risk control, you have claims administration, you have your excess insurance premiums, you have there are some self-insured ass assessments, and there is actuarial evaluation. Those are fixed costs. Those are costs that you know, you've, you've assumed, but yet you manage those costs. You're able to go out to the various different providers, negotiate those contracts yourself, whereas these fixed costs are also costs that would be in a conventional program, but these are costs that the insurance company charges. So you're managing these costs at a better level than the insurance company is. And then you also have variable costs. The variable costs are the losses. And we also put on this side, you'll see that we've actually, it's not a typo, but we've actually put the claims administration on both sides. Because a lot of times with uh, the claims administration contracts, it might be a fixed rate, but it's also dependent on the number of losses that you have. So the more losses you have, the more fixed cost claims you will be paying, but the less costs you have, the, that number goes down. So it sort of is a fixed cost and a variable cost. But these are important because the variable costs, these ones are, this is in your control to the extent that you negotiate you know, your, your contracts and your programs, but these are in your control because these are your claims, these are your people, these are the losses that you're having and you're managing those losses. So even when you do have these claims, the nice thing about this is it, the big huge thing is you enjoy the cash flow. So on a workers' comp claim, we've seen that sometimes those claims last 10, 15 years, you're not paying, if you ha ultimately, if a claim ultimately was $100,000, you didn't pay out $100,000 the first day for the claim, you paid that out over a 10 year period of time. So you've enjoyed that cash flow. And then the, the other beauty is the risk control component. Uh, in a fixed cost program where you just hand the insurance company money mm -hmm. and then they in turn will pay all the claims you don't see the direct advantage to your loss control efforts. You all have obviously spent a lot of time and money in having a safe workplace, having a safe school environment, driver training, all of these things become an investment in your program when you're self-insured because the dollars come straight out of what you would be paying in losses. So if, if you spent $10,000 on a driver training, 
and you end up having 10 less claims thanks to it, it trickles right to the bottom line. It's a direct benefit besides just the life safety and the other ancillary societal benefits. You've got a direct financial benefit, so your loss control becomes an investment as opposed to an expense. And, and that's one of the things that you see when clients go into a program that has more control. You see their costs, their claims costs going down, and it's a direct relation to now they can afford to make these investments because there is a reward for it. Again, this is a bit of a repeat of the prior slide. We sort of hit on this. You know, if when you look at the variable cost, you have to chart that out. You, you have your fixed costs that are down here. That's the, the number of the excess premiums. That's for everything that's over and above that um, retention. And then you have the variable costs. So, you know, it's a huge variation. It's completely in your control as to the amount of claims, how you spend that money. So you have the losses that are retained, and then you obviously have the, the cash flow savings. So we didn't want to get through this whole thing without really making sure that we cover both ends of the spectrum so that we always are looking at our program with our eyes wide open. So we wanted to look at just some of the pros and cons um, of being a self-insurance or a protected self-insurance program. The pros is obviously, as we talked, you absorb all those usual and expected losses in your re layer. You've done it, we've done enough analysis and you've done enough analysis to know which claims, you know, not the exact claim, but the expectation of the certain amount of claims that you're going to have in those layers. So you can absorb those. You reduce the high cost of the administration usually associated with insurance company. Cash flow, we're going to improve our cash flow with the investment income. It provides you with a staple insurance program. Rather than paying in you know, large sums of money every year for your insurance program, you pay smaller amounts and um, you're able to, you know, stabilize that over time because a lot of a large portion of your premiums is going to be dependent on your losses. If your losses are going to increase, you can expect to see a uptick in the premium. As the losses come down, yeah, it's going to level off. We're never going to get to the point of not paying any money to have the insurance, but we certainly will get it down to the minimal amount of rates. And you know, we you increase your control over the program. We just love to use that word because we think you should be in control of your program. We don't like to let the insurance companies do that. And we've been able to tailor your insurance to be very specific to the Clay County School Board. Um, when you look at some of the cons, can I to ask it, a question? Yep. On the pros, you're talking about the premium. So historically, since we've been with with Gallagher. How have our premiums been? Have we been on the decline or the uptick or what? What have we done? Because that is you know, a great question. It sounds like we are doing a fabulous job, so I would imagine our premiums are probably declining. Okay, correct? This didn't come out. That's okay. That is that's the historical pricing, but that is not how it looks on the print. <laughs> If you go to the uh, it's page seventeen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that is really oh, I'm sorry, I didn't jump ahead. Let's see. Let's see. If you go to page seventeen, I I'm not sure what happened on Absolutely. that screen on. Um, there, but <laughs> you can see. Um, you know, if you look at this, we looked at this just from a ten-year uh, historical perspective, mm -hmm. and we can see that. From back in 2008, we were close to um, 1.5 million, just shy of that. And you can see the premiums coming down significantly over time, um, down to the all-time low just last year of just under a million. And uh, just this year, we've seen that slight up. And why is that? If we're doing such a good job, why are our premiums going well, up this year? Because it, it, last year, unfortunately, we had those significant storms, Harvey, Irma, and Maria, that basically drove the entire market mm -hmm. from seven years of a declining cycle into what should have been a much harder market tightening. But the insurance industries had so much overcapitalization the last bunch of years, it we didn't see the reaction that we saw in 06 post, you know, Katrina, Rita, Wilma where premiums went up 30, 40 percent, but we're seeing this muted impact because of it. And, and again, when we say that you, you have a more stable program, when you've got a program where about half of your program costs are fixed cost premiums, 
and half are your claims, then w when you get a 10% increase in the premiums, it's really a 5% increase of, as far as your program costs. Whereas if all you were doing was paying $2 million in premium for a first dollar program, your entire $2 million goes up that same percentage. So you get this buffer, if you will, because you're not swapping dollars with insurance companies. So if there's a seven year decline in the overall insurance market, how much of this seven year savings is really ours? You said a little, you said a sec, in the first part of your mm -hmm. answer there, that there's been a seven year decline and then now because of the storms last year, we're going up. So how much of that really is our cost controls? Yeah, well actually, actually, the rates you have this year, we've actually been able to, they've either flattened out, and, and that includes the property. We were actually able to get your property to be a flat renewal versus where we're seeing most clients are getting five and 10% increases. So we thought that is actually an, an excellent renewal. And then from the package and the other lines, we actually have some decrease in your rates. Again, we were able to negotiate. The only increase that we're seeing is a result on the property because we had the property values that increased. We, we have added exposure. A new school. We added a new school. And the new buses. New buses. Is there, new buses. Yes. Is there any type of cap that is, I'm thinking like an adjustable rate mortgage, there's a cap. If there's an increase, it will be more than 2% or 3% per year and a total cap of, you know, 12% or whatever. Is there any type of cap per year when it could go up? It doesn't, like that. it doesn't really exist. What some clients have done is buy a multi-year program so that now they've stabilized it over a couple of years. Right. But and have we always been year to year? I think you've come yeah. before. Yeah, yeah for the most part. And, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for answering mm -hmm. those questions. So when you just, you know, from a con standpoint, you know, and I see the numbers shifted on there too a little bit, but, um, you know, the cons is, you know, certainly, more from a private entity standpoint, but if you were to, if they were to downsize, restructure, the program might not be able to keep pace. You know, that we see this sometimes with our city clients where, or county clients where they're including the sheriff in their program. And so their workers comp has them taking this huge, large self-insured retention. And then all of a sudden the sheriff spins out and does their own program. And so they take their loss experience, but they also take the large portion of the premium with them what then remains might not be suitable for being in a self-insured type program for the rest of the entity. That's really more of what we talk about from a restructuring downsize. Um, it's a more hands-on approach. You know, you have staff, you have people that are involved in the claims, but you know, that can be a good thing as well. It's more long-term decisions. Being in a self-insured program is not something that you would want to change. You don't want to be going to back into the conventional insurance one year and then flipping into self-insurance, there's just a lot of different moving parts to it. It's um, you know certainly a, a more complex program, but with the right minds and the right people managing it, you certainly can reap the benefits of that. And then you know we put the total program costs are really not final until the claims are, are closed. So you know if you have a workers' comp claim that stays open for 10 years, you would, wouldn't necessarily be able to look at that policy year and know what your final cost was until those claims are closed out. So I thought we would go ahead and take a look at your program and then what we've also put into here are your losses from an excess standpoint. Let me hand those out. If you The loss, the loss history that I've provided to you is not the actual loss run. I've coded it, we've taken the claimant's names off of it, claim numbers, and really even the descriptions of the accident because obviously it's a public meeting and we don't want to educate our claimants. So if there are specific claims that you want to talk about, we can certainly we can talk with Susan and her team individually to learn you want more, more about those. But we wanted to look at you know, so what we did, we put these together by policy year, the type of coverage, and then this is for losses that are in excess of 25000 Just to give you a feel for 
where your losses are, how many you have. This does not mean that this is bad that you have these losses excess of 25,000 for an organization your size. You certainly would expect that you're going to have some losses up here. When you have general liability, what, give us an example. General liability is if somebody is doing a slip, trip, and fall. Get hurt on a playground. Child gets hurt on one of the playgrounds. Child gets hurt at the school. Workers' comp is for your teachers. You have the um, auto liability. Well. Okay. Are there two from 13, 14 that are still open? Are those the same claim? Like, are they the same accident? No. No. And why, this last year on the second page, why is it low, so much lower than the year before? I mean, you, you know, well, it's a big, difference, big difference between the top and the bottom. And I just wondered what... We're, we're still paying on some of those. Yeah. Well, the the year before, they're, they're, they're open. open. Yeah. Okay. So they're accruing every single year until okay. <coughs> they're closed. Yeah. Hmm. And you still, you can still have, we call this the incurred but not reported. So you, there could be a claim out there that we just don't know about at yeah. this time. And they get, like, the employee or the person that hurt themselves lets us know, you know, 30 days from now after the policy period or six months from now. So there's always that chance that there's going to be claims that have been incurred but not yet reported. And we see that often as well. And, and then also the work comp claims that can deteriorate as well. Somebody that uh, went ahead and had some knee surgery can have some complications relative to the anesthesia. You get these mushroom effects sometimes that uh, can really spiral a claim. So that's why, for instance, a, uh, a general liability claim could still be open from 13 to 14. Uh, absolutely. Somebody is still. They, well, the general liability, they haven't settled that claim yet, so they're still working with the plaintiffs attorney probably right. to try and come up with a settlement or take the thing to trial. Can you uh, explain the outstanding reserves and total incurred? Absolutely. The, the total incurred is the sum of the amount paid and the outstanding reserves. And the outstanding reserves are the, on claims that are open, are the only place you're going to see them. And they would be the adjuster's best professional estimate of what is still to be paid to finalize that claim. And that's that outstanding reserves is made obviously at the front end of a claim and well, well there it, it's made initially and then it's adjusted as new information comes in exactly as that claim develops. And the total incurred does that include attorney's fees? That mm -hmm. would include everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. So an open case for general liability with a total incurred from 2013-14 of 48500 that would be only attorney fees, correct? We would not have paid anything to that individual until we've closed out that claim? That's not true. Not, not necessarily. So the property so damage may have been um, yep. paid, but the physical damage... Okay. Or, or you may have had multiple it. claimants and you've okay. settled with one or two claimants, yeah. but you still have another claimant that has not settled. And that would all be considered one... It's one occurrence. Claim. And, and that's the beauty of the way your program is structured. If you have a claim that has a workers' comp and an auto liability, it's a single occurrence. And only one SIR, the largest SIR, will apply. So you have some protection from a multi-line claim, if you will. Let, let me ask you this specific question um, when it comes to these yeah. issues. The general liability, and we're not going to talk about specific cases, but general liability 1415, uh, the one that starts, I think it's the second general liability entry. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, 19 and outstanding, and then total incurred is 99. Let's assume that this general liability comes under this general liability uh, column, mm -hmm. right? Our self-insured retention is $100,000, mm -hmm. so is that 99000 credited toward the self-insured retention? You know, in other words, once we pay another $1,000, it's, it's not yours anymore. Once you go over the $100,000, the insurance company will. But if it's in a lawsuit, for instance, mm -hmm. 
how does that work? You just you, you just put the insurer on notice yeah. as soon as you can. There are different there, yeah. There's different parameters yeah. and different types of claims that have different thresholds with which your uh, third-party claims administrator reports the claim to the excess carrier. Whether right. you know, certainly deaths have to be immediately reported, or if the claim itself gets to a certain level, then they report it to the carrier. So there becomes a seamless handing off of the claim, if you will. And does, the handing does, off, the adjuster, the same adjuster will handle the claim to conclusion, and they handle it on behalf of the insurance company as well. Mm -hmm. so, so there is no lag or any, any lapse, if you will, in the handling of that claim. Right. And you're talking about um, John's Eastern? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when was the last time we had a claim that went over our SIR? Any of our SIR? Well, we had one this year. <coughs> the workers' comp. We have a workers' comp that's still open. Yeah. SIR is two fifty for workers' comp though. So if I'm if I'm not mistaken, it's been eighteen years. If I'm not mistaken, wow. since we've hit the two fifty workers' comp. Yeah. See that, and that's and why my is that heart so large? Yeah. <laughs> well. well and we either pay more to the insurance company, which is going to charge us a lot more, or we we keep it contained yeah. ourselves. I guess I just feel like our, our premiums should be a lot lower if we have, if it's been that long since we've had to make a claim on an insurance policy. That's a workers' comp insurance policy that I just talked about, 18 years. No, I know, but I, I was asking the SIR on any of them. Okay. And I know workers' comp is higher at 250 but like... Liability, general liability is a hundred thousand. That may have been more recent if we've had some of those lawsuits. I think one of ours did hit recently. And um, Dave, that was the one that you were involved in at the end. Do you know which one I'm talking about? I do. The teacher? Yeah. 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 But yeah. that would be the only one. I just I don't know, it just Yeah, I mean the there are different ways to look at that, and the other way to look at that is you'll see we, what I've actually brought is some um, just some peer benchmarking, so you can sort of see where your retentions are in comparison to other individual um, entities. You know, we have clients that have actually moved when they haven't been having their insurance pay. They move that retention, you move it north. You know, so you take some more premium savings. I'm going to continue to control my claims. And what we really want you buying is buying insurance for the catastrophic type loss, something that's going to put some balance into your balance sheet to help you control those losses from the get-go. Just, I don't want to steal your thunder, <laughs> but page 19 of this handout, Ms. Condon, you know, I think kind of overlaps with your, your inquiry to the options. You know, we're talking, I think it was just pointed out that basically in the last 18 years, we yeah. haven't hit the 250. Yeah. Yeah. And workers' comp, and one of the options that you put together here, yeah. just for thought, I'm thinking you're, you put this together just for purposes of discussion, right? Well, I, it's, I mean, it's, it's discussion, but certainly, yeah. you know, your preference. You know, yeah. one of the, what I looked at and say, I don't see, you know, we get into, we get to a point where we get to you know some minimum premium. So, so you're we're not diminishing keep, returns on taking a higher so retention. The, so we look at it and say, well, let's go higher on the retention. We don't believe that we're even going to get there. So let's go ahead and and push the retention up higher. So when we looked at it, um, let me back up here for a second. One of the options that we looked at that you jumped to the end on me there. Um, so if this is the workers' compensation. You're getting charged right now for, say, this workers' compensation layer. This is 250,000 of coverage, excess of the 250,000 self-insured retention. We can totally eliminate that layer of coverage and just buy this coverage here, which brings us to a $500,000 self-insured retention. That was the option that um, I think I have on there. Yeah. So. And why do we have that now? If the, the, the thought with the 250 is if we have a really bad year or somebody gets really, really, really hurt, you know, 
we're going to meet the 250 and then insurance takes over but we haven't had anything catastrophic when it comes to workers comp in about 18 years so if we go just to the catastrophic level we're saving like forty thousand dollars in insurance so if we start saying in 18 years we've never even hit the 250 why not put it up to 500 and save the 40,000 every year? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So you now, keep in mind years. though, yeah. all it takes is one, one accident yeah. and we've hit the catastrophic. But, but we've hit the catastrophic. And you know, the chances of that happening, you know, I mean, we're gambling. That's kind of it what comes insurance down to is. What, what right. is your what is your tolerance for, for yeah. risk? For risk. Yeah. Right, but you could have six hundred thousand dollars in the bank if it had done absolutely. Right. Right. If you had done it over these years, you're absolutely but, right. And that is one of the things that we asked Joy to look at this year was yeah. at workers' comp level. What if we took it to a catastrophic? What would our savings be? Because we haven't had an incident where it's good. We, we have clients that I'm gonna we're gonna months. jump around here for a I second, know, but one just of so the risk that we could take if we decide to do that, well, again, it takes one. And then, yeah, it, know, it introduces volatility. Wipe us out because we're not really there yet to have the reserves that we really need in mm -hmm. order to take care of anything. Right, but mm -hmm. then, but then, is it worth paying it every? We've paid six hundred thousand dollars for the right. past eighteen years mm -hmm. and never spent it. Right. So when you're talking about taxpayer dollars, mm -hmm. so six hundred thousand dollars for eighteen years, mm -hmm. or the what if one at two fifty? When we we have history that says we've never, never. been there. Yeah. Again, it's a risk that everyone is. That what if? Is okay. Because what if one comes in and it's at that five hundred thousand? Well, they are now we're paying out half a million dollars. Yes. True, but yeah. also keep in mind cash flow. You're going to have that right. loss, it's aggregate. and it's yes. not going to. You're yeah. not going to pay the five hundred or six hundred thousand exactly. at once. Right. But that's going to be a large loss. It's going to take over years years. to. It's, it mm -hmm. could stay open for years. You're going to pay but that over time. That's so exactly the discussion, okay. though, as you move along that yeah. risk retention yeah. control continuum. Where you say, okay, what level of volatility are we comfortable accepting, and, and at, at what trade-off? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go. So yeah. I, I jumped around a little bit just so that you can so get a better. That's where the conversation is going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I do. I think we need to. So here, here, here you are. These are your peers. I didn't put the client names right. on it. It's public record, right. but. Yeah. I, I wouldn't do that to you guys as well. I would, you know, right. I'd share your information, but you know in a as much confidentiality as we can. So you can see here's, we use a few benchmarks on it. We use your total insured values, property basis, payroll basis, and then looking at the different self-insured retentions. So you can see you're actually on the lower end of that spectrum. Right, wait just a minute. Site. I am not an insurance person. Okay, okay. Yep. TIV is total, total insurance insured value. value. Yes. Payroll, the next is what? Workers', workers comp, comp self-insured retention. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I'll get home and yep. study this, no. and then I won't know what I'm looking at. Workers' comp, self-insurance. Self-insured retention. Mm -hmm. Retention. Yeah. GL is general liability, self-insured retention. General liability, okay. And AL is auto liability, self-insured retention. So just about all of our peers have way higher yeah. self-insured retentions mm -hmm. than yeah. we do. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. they're, they're, they're some of them are larger. Some of some them are, are bigger. Larger. Some of them some are of more them. litigious environments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we have a good claims history. Yep. Oh, I very. Would assume that yeah, you can say this one. I certainly would call this one of your peers. Mm -hmm. You know, your 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 benchmarking, your exposure information, is similar. And yeah. I would assume if they've kept their self insurance retentions as high as they have yeah. they have pretty good claims histories as well yeah. so yeah people you know we as you can see with especially these workers comp you can see everybody starts pushing them higher okay and some people push it hot as high as being completely self-insured which I don't I wouldn't necessarily advocate <coughs> for workers comp to be wow. going completely we call that bare because I mean, you could always bump that retention up to a million and a half. You know, bump it up so because you have the propensity. If you know one large claim, such as a paraplegic, I mean, we have I have seen claims that get in the couple million dollar range, and so you do want something. Or a multi-insured claim where, where you have say a bleacher collapse at a football game, and you have several teachers, teachers. hurt. Mm -hmm. No, we don't. No, tell me about yes. it. <laughs> 
Unfortunately, we've, we've dealt with some of these and they're miserable. <laughs> some of ours are not. Oh. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other thoughts on it? That's really mm. look at it. It's just I see it's to help you put it into perspective as to where you are and where you want to go. I, I see a couple of them even have more for the general liability and the auto. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Have absolutely. you given us? I, I guess yeah. I should go back and look. Mm -hmm. Yep. The options yeah. I for mean, that you could too. go as far as increasing yeah. both your workers' compensation and bringing your your um, GLAL retention oh. up to where the, the sovereign immunity caps are. That's why most people... That's to the 200,000. Mm -hmm. So... So 58,000 in one year of savings. Yep. And that's if we went to the 200,000 mark. Mm -hmm. See, some of them are three and five. How many Most of our general and auto have we, we haven't even really exceeded? It's mostly all workers' comps. So yes. mm -hmm. it's probably in this no safe risk. But. but that's why I wanted to ask, that's why I asked to look at this because mm -hmm. yeah. just, we, if we just keep doing what we keep doing, we'll never yeah. absolutely evolve. Absolutely <laughs> receive absolutely. the savings. GPS has improved our auto liability in, immensely. Immensely. There are so many less auto accidents these past couple of years. The age of fleet also impacts, you know, as we get to work and fleet. Yeah. As we yeah. replace fleet. Your maintenance program. Fluctuations, yeah. fluctuations in the market price for protection of the, the newer fleet mm -hmm. is going to rise. Now, if we have a bunch of 1987 Dodges in the white fleet, like we have, <laughs> so, um, you know, that's, that's very running? cheap. Yeah, the, yeah, the one on Chitty Chitty Bang Bangs, but have, yes, we're, we're running. <laughs> the one in Keystone is it's still transports the golf team. <laughs> <laughs> but as we but as we're required to replace fleet, we only now have market uh, mark, yeah. market fluctuation yeah. on the price on our coverage. So, well, I hesitate to even ask this, but is that because people were reading maps and that it's a GPS? Has uh, I think that they can tell. I mean, this is my opinion, and it's just an opinion. <laughs> I think that we can see how fast they're going. Mm -hmm. um, they're being a little bit more careful because. Sure. They can be seen how fast they're going. We've actually been able to use it to our benefit on more than one claim where we were able to say, no, we were only going 30 miles an hour. So we couldn't have done what you're saying we did. We shut down what claims before they ever went to legal. I mean, I've had a really good history with um, auto liability claims these past couple of years. Right. And I, I've seen it completely. I mean, I believe that the GPS has made a really big impact in that. Even in our workers' comp when it comes to monitors and the drivers. I mean, if they're not getting in accidents, workers' comp for them. My biggest claims this year were teachers. Yeah. And that's unheard of. And cameras, on buses as well. Cameras. Yeah. Huge yeah. difference. Huge. Yeah. Uh, out, outward facing cameras yeah. to see what, what happened with, from the driver's view as well as yeah. people making claims on the inside of things happening inside the buses. Yeah. Uh, so having being able to make sure that we get cameras on every every yeah. yellow fleet absolutely that we have would, absolutely. Be beneficial. would be huge so if we did some of the savings things we could maybe shift some of those reinvest things. yeah reinvest yes. them into other absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah self insured the camera, camera shut down two claims already this year yeah. completely shut it down uh, so interesting yeah we we mentioned you know, just for purposes of discussion a, a comparison <coughs> here it is helpful it's better than having nothing mm -hmm. okay but we also have to take into consideration uh, third-party administrators <coughs> these folks have or these districts have uh, third-party administrators like John's Eastern what they pay for it how much they usually pay on an annual basis because it's not just the contract it's also the fees that go along with each claim mm -hmm. and then do these comparators uh, you know, pay outside counsel out of self-insured retentions, mm -hmm. uh, or do they have yeah. four or five attorneys in-house? You know, that never draw from the self-insured retention. So it's all—it's a big ball of wax uh, to take into consideration, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Hmm. Yeah, I
Do we want to talk about this chart? Do you feel good about this one? <laughs> All right, we got our peers. We got that one we looked at. So these are these are the um, basically coming up on the end here, looking at the premiums and the options. Um, from our last meeting, we did go back. We were able to renegotiate a few of the lines of coverage to take a few thousand dollars off uh, the school board package as well as um, the excess workers comp as well. I think the biggest thing right now as we were just talking about is really figuring out where you want to go in terms of the options, in terms of where you want to be. You know, I certainly, we certainly, as we start out talking, we certainly advocate wanting you to buy the least amount of insurance, you know, obviously, but finding that the sweet spot. The sweet so spot for that is at is that agenda review. We had asked a question about the active assailant, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and is this fifteen thousand dollars the same amount that was there at that time? Ten thousand. Go back to this page. This one. Yeah. The active assailant. I believe it's the same price. Yeah. That yeah. is the same price. The that grade. is not. A, okay. That is so not inclusive of the um, school safety school officers. Safety school safety guards. officers. So where do they fall program. into all of this? At this point, we well. First of all, they would end up, that coverage will end up going into the school board package here. Okay. okay. That's where that's a liability. liability type coverage that you would need. Um, at this point, the carriers, we don't have enough underwriting information right. to do that. Okay. There's, mm -hmm. you know, details of the loss control programs, the, you know, how you're going to be training these officers, right. things right. of that, that nature that need to be further elaborated with the carriers so that they can price it accurately. They gave us an indication a while back with a large self-insured retention, and it was really truly just based on the number of officers. There wasn't any actual underwriting that they were able to do because you don't have the information just yet. So. Um, it's to answer your question, the premium is not included in this. We would have to come back to what, you. What happens it. in August when school opens and we have, you know, SROs and SSOs in all our schools mm -hmm. and something, God forbid, should happen? Are we well, we've been working yeah. closely with Chris. I mean, she's yeah. gathering the information. Yeah, absolutely. We just don't I'm just have waiting on the program to be <coughs> with Mr. Kemp's yeah. group. Okay. So, so I mean, you'll have to come back to us and we'll have to renegotiate or re-approve or something, amend it? Yeah, yes. they would add the coverage. The coverage will get added on by way of what we would call an endorsement to the school board package. And yeah. whether that's $5,000 of premium, $10,000, we just don't know the actual cost right now because we don't know the full details of the program. And unfortunately, this is how it's <coughs> being done with all of the different schools. So board none of your districts have come back with any information? Yet. Everybody's yeah. gathering their information. Yeah. Right now. So I, the think, I think with all of this, uh, SROs and SSOs, uh, it's called everybody really trying to figure out how it's going to work, what's mm -hmm. going to be handled. So I think on that, it's just, we're just going to have to plow through it. Yeah, just I like mean, we're, we're working county. closely, you know, Chris keeps sending us more information and we're, we're working pretty extensively okay. with the carriers to try to get that, Carol, but we will have to be coming much. back to you. So, so, so for my clarification, can you explain a little more about the fifteen thousand dollar for active assailant and what that what that entails? Yeah, that's that is actually more of like a um, an event, a or property something. business yeah, interruption response. types of uh, uh, exposure. So it's more for the physical the damage and okay. having to relocate to other school to another school to keep the, the school going it, itself. That's not the, the liability piece of the active assailant. What would an example of that be? So we have an, say we have an event at a school and you have to shut, you're going to shut part of the school down and right. you don't want to go back to that campus. So right. now there's um, costs that are involved in, um, in, the relocation. in the relocation. So like when we bust all our kids right. from there's also crisis response. There's some other grief counseling, grief counseling, okay. things of that nature that are involved in that type of. Thing. Have we ever had to file a claim for that? No. 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 Thank God. Thank God. But we actually add, if I may, uh, yeah. we actually added it last year because of the activity that happened that year before, yep. right there around here. So I had asked Jory to please yeah. look into that. I think it's, yeah. it's good to yeah. have that. 
think we should. So yeah. obviously you've shown us that there's savings in the way that we do things, but for argument's sake of how much savings, how what would our renewal look like if we had insurance to cover the 500 to 1.3 million that we've had to pay out? Do you understand my question? So if we, if we cover that gap every year, so we never had to pay out the 500,000 to the 1.3 million, what would that premium have, what, what would that be, what would we be looking at more additional every year? I, I, think if they, I don't if they go first you, dollar yeah so so are you saying you want to increase our our deductible no if no, we, we do if we went the other direction zero. oh to take it to zero yes. zero yeah. charge yes was that the eighteen thousand no because that would be well, your, your, your that. workers comp okay. premium would then be based on your manual rates which <clears throat> So you're wanting, you're asking the question if we're to go from there. To go back here? Yeah. Right. So if, so like last year we paid out 700 and something. Right. So so you're, you're last year we paid out, or I'm sorry, 16, 17, we paid out $765,000 in the round. Those were the claims over 25000 Okay. So if we had not had to pay out mm -hmm. that amount of money, what would we be looking at in premium difference? Annually, we already pay your uh, the renewal <coughs> payment at what 1.4 million? Where's that page? Yeah, I think the best way to yeah. probably explain that is the biggest piece is going to come from your workers' compensation. So if you're going to go from a self-insured program of workers' compensation into a first dollar program, the rating mechanism for first dollar workers' comp is based on the payroll based on rates that are assigned to that classification and which is what we call your manual premium. Your manual premium alone for workers' compensation is probably somewhere around 1.5 million to 2 million. Okay. And that's, and so that, that becomes the starting point okay. for the workers' That's what comp. I wanted to know because yeah. I think yeah. it's important for taxpayers to know that. Mm -hmm. So instead of paying 1.5 to 2 million dollars, more and paying it up front than mm -hmm. the one so so total we would pay two to two and a half million dollars for all of our insurances and instead of that we we incur some risk of having to pay out like two years ago seven hundred sixty five thousand dollars but that's still less than paying the premium every year to have that insurance that's correct right. that well, was the question yeah and and what you're talking about is the this uh, end of this spectrum, the yeah. far left of that spectrum, mm -hmm. which virtually none of your school in, uh, clients do. Okay. You lose control. The, the yeah. leftward motion, I suppose, yeah. that in reality could be captured, depending on what investment mm -hmm. the board wants to make in it, is shifting to the left with protected self-insurance. Would you agree? Yes, that, yeah. that would be an incremental step versus going all the way Doing back. Doing a massive right. swing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, Ms. Herrick has asked me, is that, was I asking to do that? And I wasn't. When I wanted oh, you to, wanted no, to were just, I, I yeah, I wanted to capture that, that there's a lot less risk there, mm -hmm. but it's a lot so it's more money right. that it costs yeah. us to have a lot less risk. You can typically consider when you're, there you'd be swapping dollars with the insurance company. Mm -hmm. When you're swapping dollars with an insurance company, you're probably paying 30 to 40 percent premium for the benefit of, because they've got their administrative costs, their overhead, they do pay premium taxes even though you all are exempt. So you, you start adding in all this frictional cost. That's why when we're looking to design a program for a client, it's where do we, what's that sweet spot where the client is retaining their known and expected losses and we're not handing these over to an insurance company because we know if we are swapping dollars consistently with the insurance company, we're losing in that transfer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think.
think we've gone through most of these options. Obviously, the you know, the first one is that loss when we talked about that early on. So if you were uncomfortable, which I don't think you necessarily are totally uncomfortable with taking those retentions, you can cap the amount of retentions that you would pay in a, in a certain year. You would pay an additional premium for that, but the 1.7 million that they want to set that target at for you it seems exponentially high for where you would be going. We think that obviously option B makes sense for you. And we've seen from the loss experience that you're doing well. And so our philosophy is move further to the right of the spectrum. So you, you increase those retentions. That's certainly an option for you. Um, we can also do, um, Look at that. I see that the lettering is a little bit off, so the blank uh, option there, but we could remove the that blue layer that we showed, mm -hmm. the 250, exit 250,000 um, layer in the pet, and having ultimately having your workers' compensation retention move to 500,000, having okay. a 40,000 dollar. And, and a comment that I would make on that, we had talked about one of the cons, if you will, of self-insurance is that you really have to look at it over the long term. Uh, we have had clients that go ahead and say, well, you know what, we're going to go ahead and increase our self-insured retention on the workers' comp. They'll save forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. They have a claim that year, over, and then they go back and buy it down. It, you, it's like buying a stock. You're trying to time it. Don't try and time the market. Mm -hmm. If it's the right strategy, even if it, the timing was off, that you happen to have that one in 18 year claim in that year, now you you've got to go ahead and continue with that philosophy for it to work and for you to benefit from it instead right. of trying to get in or out where the timing you could be a genius that nothing happened and, and or you can be a goat that well wait a minute and, and no it's neither it's simply this is the right strategy for us it fits our risk appetite it fits our budget and this is what we're going to implement over a continual so it's time, in, it's time in the strategy, not timing the strategy. Exactly right. right. So, and this could be an annual savings of $58,000, but we still know that we're going to have to pay a premium for SRO, SSO, Guardian right. Program also, which we don't know what that will be. So I don't expect it to be that much, I don't, Yeah, though, no. nowhere near that much. Okay. No, the initial indication and like I said the indication was only based on the number of officers there's very little information do you know if there's a difference between um, the premium on an SRO versus an SSO is there a difference no they they would just be looking at the, the program in, in general they, except do we pay at the for but the retentions oh, yeah. that they're going to be looking at they're most con which is why we're having trouble getting the, the um, quote, they're mostly concerned about your ability to control and manage your losses within your your layer. So that's why they want to learn a little bit more about the policies, procedures of having those folks. So do we ensure that SROs? No. Yeah, no. That's what I was, was going to say. Those, so those, those, those sheriffs? The sheriffs. Yeah. Uh, the sheriff. Uh, we we, we, we don't be dealing with it. SROs. Uh, SROs. Uh, SROs. Uh, SROs. Uh, SROs. Yeah. So that, that was the kind SRO of a term of art. Yes, that's so. And the only question there would be, what does your MOU with the sheriff call for? We've got about four people. We've got about four people talking right now. Uh, let's let uh, Mr. Agala talk, and then I heard some talk behind me, and everybody will get a chance. But I cannot listen to four conversations at one time, and I don't think you can. All right, let's go. You Thank you. Just, I just wanted to make the point that what you want to make sure you you look at that MOU with the sheriff's office, uh -huh. and whether or not you have any liability, whether you've agreed to assume or you've transferred all of it because it, that will, we want to make sure that your insurance program dovetails with whatever obligations or commitments exist in those MOUs. Okay, and Mr. Daggett, I want you to make sure that you yeah, we have, up. We have we made that have. very, very, very clear. Mm -hmm. that SROs. That's what she was talking about. Okay. We are additionally now, insured by the SROs. All right, you have Perfect. the floor now. We are additionally insured by the sheriff's offices. Our guardian programs would be our liability, which is why that yep. would fit into the 300,000 program. Yes. Okay. okay. Does anyone so. else have a comment or question? All right, we got quiet now. Let me go again. Well, but one last thing, you know, and it doesn't have to be resolved here. I'd love to be able to talk with you a little bit further mm -hmm. on this. 
you know, we're looking at the real costs and, and, and the anticipated costs. You know, whenever we talk about actuary, we're talking about anticipated costs based on history. We've seen in this handout that we received some time ago, mm -hmm. our loss experience history, we've kind of clarified that those losses have been first paid out of our self-insured retention. Um, that's real money. We have also a history of um, uh, hiring outside counsel for liability cases. Yeah. We've always had outside counsel for mm -hmm. workers' comp, and it's made mm -hmm. sense. Uh, for, for liability cases, when, when I say liability, I, I'm talking basically tort, okay? Oh, yeah. what, what, what can be sued for that isn't workers' comp? Mm -hmm. Um, and the costs have fluctuated, gone up, gone down. Sometimes they've been very high, other times they've been not so high. Mm -hmm. So I've worked in other places, I'm involved in lawsuits where there's other agencies that uh, upon uh, the filing of the lawsuit, the other agency uh, simply demands defense from its insurer and its in-house counsel get regular reports from whoever the insurer hired. Mm -hmm. Okay, we don't have that in, in any of our uh, uh, coverages. That is, if we're sued for um, uh, tort, for any type of property damage or anything like that, we can't turn to an insurer to demand a defense. Okay, mm -hmm. that's, that's accurate, right? And because, as we see here, insurers aren't on the hook. Right, you are. Until we get past that self-insured retention. You're, you're the insurer. So one thing that I would love to explore with, with you, and again, we can explore it later and maybe come back to the board, just in the general liability uh, column and, and in the coverages, what, if any, um, options we might have whereby, you know, we're sued, it's the same set of claims against us as it is against another government agency, say, say the county or the sheriff's office or whoever. Um, and while they can simply demand a defense to their insurer, we can't, okay? We've, we've got to deal with the claims against us. I handle it to the best of my ability. Oftentimes, it, because I am one person, uh, we'll need outside counsel. So I would love to be in a place where we can be similarly situated with these various agencies, to include the, the county. Um, where we can simply uh, turn to an insurer to demand a defense in a lawsuit. So that's one of the things that I'd love to explore with you all mm -hmm. afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So on box E. Yes. So are you saying we could save an additional thirty thousand from the fifty-eight thousand above them if we added a blue box under the general liability auto liability that says five hundred thousand? So <laughs> what they're saying here is that um, you're gonna, if you're gonna remove the workers' compensation retention, <coughs> but you're gonna go ahead and add back in, you're gonna add in a loss fund, so of the remaining coverages for the general liability, the auto, errors and emissions, and property coverages of um, a $500,000 loss fund. So there would the be premium. A, so, <coughs> so on this premium page, yes. there would be a five hundred thousand dollar box yes. in those. Yes. All yes. of those. Yes. All yes. Of and we yeah. can save for thirty workers thousand comp. more. Mm -hmm. <coughs> for the workers comp column? The workers comp the no. Yellow, but the, the remaining yellow. coverages, yes. The yellow ball. Well, right. The, the yellow remaining box. would stay hundred. The two fifty would be five hundred, is that well yeah. is that they would the <laughs> we always try to come up with all different options. I probably haven't come up with exactly. We would. Go back to the chart. Yeah, let me. Add. So we would be, make sure you have that out for me. We would be eliminating this. We would be eliminating this. We would then would the 250 <coughs> become 500 yes. on the bottom? Right. The yes. yellow becomes. Yes. It stretches the, the yellow. The yellow, the yellow would become 500. Yes. Right. Yes. And there'd be no middle Lloyds of London. Right. Okay. There would be no Lloyd, Lloyds of London on that and coverage. And what about the general liability? In auto? These would all, would all stay the same because I didn't look at it at a different retention. 
So we would keep the rest of the retentions the same, but add a loss fund of $500,000. That $1. annual aggregate protection that we were talking about before in the protected self-insurance, that would be including now an annual aggregate of 500000 instead of the $1.7 so since it doesn't include the workers' comp. It would be adding this uh -huh. of 500000 for those remaining coverages not inclusive of the workers' so comp. So if those claims went above 500000 then that, that would drop would down. In. Correct. Those, if those claims aggregately, so adding up, you know, we have 100000 Five claims of a hundred or any combination uh, of... Once you... You know, not including work comp. Not including not workers' comp. Not so we'll right. And that would be an additional thirty thousand dollars of savings in addition to the forty-eight thousand from doing the two things above. No, no. The, the thirty is the forty-eight plus the eighteen that you're paying okay. for. It's just minimizing so the loss yeah. to half a million in the other yeah. area. Correct. Yeah. I mean, it's you got it. We're talking of fifty-eight thousand dollars. But we really haven't ever. So what's seen the bottom that? line on all that? Uh, that one doesn't make as much. I know. I no, it, it doesn't but when we're talking about bumping yeah. our retentions yeah. up. I think mm -hmm. we've moved past. You're better off just it bumping did, the workers. Did when I did that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I like this. Good job. Better off. You're better off just bumping that workers' comp retention <laughs> <laughs> and not buying the aggregate. Correct. Okay. Right. Correct. That's what we're so right. on the on this page where you've got your options. Mm -hmm. I'll get that. Okay. Are you gonna get I get a, I get a little wild the with the bottom them. line here. Yeah. So we're talking. With, I'm, I'm talking about <laughs> on our proposal. So the proposal so that I. So this? Okay. So. Hold on. We go back to this page. So option one. So we have the. We have the million, either way you want to look at it. You can look at the million 86. Okay, right. that's your number, that's your starting point. Okay. okay. And what is option one? With option one is the expiring option. Okay. Is, is what you, okay. is what you have. That's what we currently have and what the premiums are going right. to. Right. And so now, if we want to make any changes, mm -hmm. adjusting retentions, we're going to adjust them off of the million 86 that we showed okay so I don't think I think we're in agreement that option A doesn't, a doesn't make sense option B um, we think that one makes sense so we would take 18 grand off of the million 86 yes. both uh, parts of that and yeah I guess we could 40. B2 is what we could probably call that one so we remove the layer the workers compensation layer another 40 thousand option c doesn't make any sense for you that's actually going the opposite way of buying your retentions down we don't think e or whatever we messed up our lettering here but option e doesn't make any sense and then the other this was just more of a one-off option that the carrier had given us on the act of assailant yeah but that one intrigues me because mm -hmm. it we have a ten thousand dollar deductible mm -hmm. but it, for a million dollar limit but you're saying we could go to five million dollars for an additional ten thousand? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that one might make sense. I don't know. I mean, if we had to, you know, um, Broward is taking that entire building. They had to relocate all those classrooms, and they're making it a memorial. That's yes. way more than a million dollars. Mm -hmm. I know five million dollars wouldn't go toward, but at least it would be a little bit right. to, to for temporary classroom space or something. I don't know. I mean, what do you? I think if you look at it though, like, for eight classrooms. For eight classrooms. I'm just thinking. Um, you know, we talk about risk, and is the risk worth, worth the cost? You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure that um, the numbers would be favorable on that decision. Until what happens? Ten thousand additional. Ten thousand is not a lot of money in a three hundred eighty-four million dollar budget. Um, again. It, it, you know, uh, my budget for next year included the one million eighty-six. You know, if the decision is to reduce the premium, that's a big favor to us, of course. Mm -hmm. But then again, it's a risk. You know that we will then end up having to pay more for the program, of course. But we never made it. You know, over time. So um, 
And um, as far as the act of assailant, um, I, I think with the savings, there could be the absorption to where we could add. It's always good to add more insurance. It always is. Almost always good to add protection if we can afford it. So, um, you know, uh, as, but again, we're not sure what the cost would be for the SSOs. So part of the savings would go to what's that as well. So, um, but they don't think it's going to be fifty-eight thousand dollars. So right. we're looking so, at probably five or ten. This is the your initial answer. indication <laughs> yeah. for the. Um, I, mean, I think you're making good decisions. About yeah. I think you're making good decisions by being so. I mean, the idea maybe it's going to be yeah. ten to fifteen. At ten thousand dollars, you would have to have one claim every five hundred years in order for it to be a wise decision. For the say that again. Wait a minute. I want to even say that again. <laughs> At a ten thousand dollar premium, uh -huh. if you're buying five million in limit, if you have a claim once every five hundred years, you are getting your money back. Okay. So that's yeah. just to put it into a context of how I like to look at the payback or the return on it. So where are we with our million dollar? So we have a million dollars for fifteen. Fifteen thousand. A million for fifteen. Your your payback period on that is. Thirty-three years. Yeah. No, you're. Yeah, uh, you're. Ta you're saying you're the million. And yeah, I guess I'm food. having a hard time in my head trying to figure out the he's, right thing to do. He's on benchmarking it. when he's talking the accuracy. He's benchmarking the premium against the limit right. that that policy is given. Right. Yeah. Okay. I know, was just, that what your question was? No, or were you talking no, about the that one's the one I'm having a hard time kind of trying to figure out in my head I, because I appreciate it, Ms. Gilhausen's comp. Comment, and I think if we end up in an, God forbid, we end up in an active assailant situation, I'm not sure that's, I, I'm not sure our loss is, that's going to be, in, that's, that that's going to matter. Well, think about how but much dough just cost us to build. Right. I mean, how, how much did it cost us? Are we, if, if it happens at Doe, are you going to close Doe and make it a memorial? Or if it happens at Grove Park Elementary, which is valued this way, maybe you do close Grove Park, but are you really going to close Doe? I mean, it's the chances... Is, of, again, the risk. Yeah. Is the, it going to happen? You I mean, know. is it possible that it's going to happen? It's you, possible. Is it likely? We would like to think not, especially well, with the Guardians and the SROs. No. No. I mean, you can think of it as this as well, and this might be a stretch. Uh, you think about our hurricanes. Yeah. How often and frequently do we have that? Uh, a couple of years You're ago, we had a savings. The last two years. Yeah. We actually increased our windstorm <laughs> but yeah, coverage we didn't because do a claim. Our, our buildings are so old yeah. that we know that it will cost us a lot. If there's any increase that we need to take in, into consideration that could potentially happen, I would say look at our windstorm coverage. Yeah. Because that's really where it's going to cost that's us right. more than right. anything else. Yeah. And I would so, also suggest that if, we, if we're going to consider that F, mm -hmm. then we should look at other school districts where those situations have happened and where did that money come from in order for them to turn that into a memorial. Because I would venture to guess that there's probably, in a situation like that, private donors that are going to come in. And, and, and that's a very affluent area. Are. Right? Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> this is a guess. We're all just mm -hmm. going to, you know, how much, what do you feel? But mm -hmm. right now, and God, I may regret this. God forbid something happened. But right now, as Dr. Ogutko said, I'm more worried about hurricanes and trees blowing through our buildings like it did, you know, mm -hmm. several homes in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And we all hope and pray that nothing happens to trigger this um, and we, we have we're doing everything we possibly can you know to prevent this from happening but I'm just not sure that I want to spend 2,000 <coughs> additional premium right now <coughs> God forbid don't tell me I said this if something happens no, but, but I mean you've got <laughs> they're, they're reaching, you know, for all to see. <laughs> just what? But but you reach a point yeah. that we don't need to do an over. But we we're human, and we're just going to have to go with it. But right now, I 
I'll go along with whatever y'all want to do on it, but it just I feel the same. And, and it just makes me a little anxious. Yes. To clarify again for me, that's not the money that would be paid to the families, victims' families. That's not the money that would be paid for employees. That's like if we had to close a building or something, is that what you're So that's why I was trying to say that wouldn't be where we would really be no. trying to focus. No. No. Yeah. I, I, that's that's yes, yes. that's the thing, and, 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 and focusing on the families, not yes. the building. Yes, we I would agree. try to do whatever we could for right. those families, the students, and get them back to normal. Right. See whether it's right. going right. to another school or busing to another yeah. school. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 But, you, yeah. but I think in other yeah. avenues we can handle. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's my feelings. If y'all want to, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think with the you majority. know. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. I mean, I don't know if y'all feel the same way or not, yeah. but I'm just a little bit anxious mm -hmm. on that one. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so obviously, the, the um, you know, we don't make decisions here, and it's teed up for right. the, the, the board's uh, decision right. uh, Thursday. I think, if, you know, the takeaway, one takeaway here is uh, you just uh, take the recommendation as stated. Mm -hmm. I think the most concrete um, option that actually has a dollar figure attached to it and so far as savings is the wiggle room and the workers comp mm -hmm. right where where you're either making this yellow mm -hmm. keeping it as is or you're going to increase it to 500,000 mm -hmm. in order to achieve a $40,000 per year savings right I would urge the, the board to consider that mm -hmm. as, a, as a first step perhaps and remember when we're talking about the coverage of SSOs, that is not per se active assailant. In fact, it probably in most instances isn't even at all related. Yeah. No. Right. What we're talking about with SSOs, here's what we do know. No one that I know of, and you just stated, uh, none of the school districts have achieved actual underwriting. Mm -hmm. right. It's what I'm seeing in the report is similar to what I'm hearing from other districts insofar as you're going to have to put a, aside a new self-insured retention mm -hmm. of 300,000 bucks probably, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. And hope that Brit or Lloyds of London uh, uh, issues you uh, coverage. Well, you know, it's interesting because Texas saw no increase in rates. Kansas right. saw rates go through the roof. Correct. So it's crazy to me yeah. that yeah. in the yeah. same country that, yeah. and that's the same section of the country. Yeah. <laughs> well, they may have different tort caps. Right. It doesn't matter. Okay. Which, those I'd like to ask. Oh, okay. So what you're that saying, let me get this straight. Mm -hmm. The 48 to 58,000 reduction in premium for B. Right. So we would just subtract that from this 1086. Well, could yes. you bring it back in a format with option three? And then at yeah. the board meeting when we have to approve, we can choose which we option. Will, uh, absolutely. Yep. Yes. So if there's an option three that shows those changes. Mm -hmm. It's just yep. basically. Do you want a three big. and a four where it shows one or the other and one with both? I, th I think. Think? Both. No, I think just, just, just three. One. Just three. Just showing including B. Both sections of B for option three. Okay. So the, that even though the board yeah, yeah, both of those are both of the deductibles. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 So, right. And it just cost savings. Increase in both self-insured retentions. One to five hundred and the other to the two hundred. B. Yeah, it does. Yeah, both parts of B since my lettering does. Which would be fifty-eight thousand. Correct. Yes. So that would work. That puts more on you than it's an opportunity to search. It saves us money. 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 It has a recommendation from the superintendent, option A, option B. So since we're modifying the options, um, what would you like me to say as far as coming from the superintendent? He'll be back, um, what, this weekend? Yeah. Why don't you He's just add it as an amendment? Okay. Um, and then when whoever it comes up before it can say, um, we're, we're not recommending, uh, recommending option C. This is okay. this yeah. is right, this is on this week's agenda. Yes, it uh, is. Since it's Tuesday, yeah. you can go ahead and. Uh, 
adjust that, okay. Okay, that'll that give us the 48 hours. Show right. three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we'll call it option will, number three. I'll yes. Yes. revise it from what is the uh, What is this option to this other company? So, <laughs> and I, I could even take off object. It, it, when we met a few weeks ago, they actually, their price was, their price was that price. We were actually able to go back to both carriers and say, is that your best number? And they kept theirs where it was, and the other one brought theirs down. So, which is why both excess workers. So, why don't we have a one and a two now? You don't need the two. Why anymore. don't we get rid, of, get rid one of one of these and, yeah. and then add three, and right. three can be the new two? Yeah, I can. <laughs> it, it, three weeks ago, I didn't want to make a whole lot of changes because I knew you had the old version. Hey, kind of like 50 is the new 20. Yeah, right. I'm going to go to Jordan Diet Ray. Three, that's what I thought yeah. I heard. Yeah. So I'm going to eliminate options. And then the answers are on there. And then the next, yes. what I insert is I'm going to call it option three. <laughs> you got close. You tried. <laughs> 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 okay. You want the option two. Okay. You want the eliminated option two. Well, she's saying two, just so this one, two. Two. because this one was already labeled as two. Right. Here we are. Do you want me to call it three? That's good. That's okay. We're eliminating the second two. Right. I, get, so my, I guess my question on yeah. that, from right. a, um, you know, just making sure, from a procedural standpoint, if I eliminate option number the option number two box mm -hmm. and I put a box there, you're going to call that option three, or does that become the new option? Number well, are you two? eliminating? Well, I thought that's what I heard you say. Or would you rather mm -hmm. me just leave the option two? I that think makes you no leave sense. this as is. Just leave this it is as already the back three. three, and you don't and then need to confuse the citizens and okay. add three. Yes. Okay. Yes. You can just add out the three of that. I'll just, just add a third page, column. and it can just be. Yep. You don't have to change all this. It doesn't even have to be this PowerPoint. It can be one additional page, option three, and then we're adding to it because we are adding it as an add-on. I think what you originally probably had. Separate. is the executive yes. summary. So right. I'll fix right. this, which mm -hmm. is what okay. you originally had, right. and I'll put the... And you can right. provide right. us with that that right. night. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just bring the new, new copy of that. one of these Thursday night. But what's posted for the backup? But I'll, I'll, I'll do, do you need it for the backup for the agenda yes. item within 48 yes. hours? I'll get it to you. you I'll bring it. Today. I'll bring it. Yeah. She won't I'll bring us a hard well, copy. Yeah. It doesn't well, we matter if this is done today. Eight hours. What? I think they would need it today to get it into right. the agenda. Yeah, item. I you, can call. We can, you window. can bring us this Thursday night, okay. but as long as we've got the 48 hours on the, the, the one additional, additional page. Okay. Okay. Oh, wait, Are there any wait, other Wait, Jury's confused. You want me to update this? No. 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 Just, just, the, just the option, right. Colin, has to be just the option today. Page. Just this page. Just that page. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, so I the can public send can review it, it and, and yeah. determine if they have questions to bring yep. before we mm -hmm. vote. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. I can have all of this to you. And Dr. Gutko will help. I'll make sure mm -hmm. it's so, on there. Because, okay. and Karen, uh, uh, Ms. Well, Bush knows, she'll get it on the okay. agenda within 48 hours. Well, I mean, that's the only page that we need to. To change okay. so we'll Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Are, are there any other comments or questions? Mm -hmm. no. I want you to know something. I, I will be the first to tell you I am not an insurance person. Mm -hmm. um, I I really have to grasp the whole concept <laughs> with all in these acronyms. I don't, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, but I will say I don't know what this is, so please mm -hmm. tell me. But you made it very clear yes, and very understandable clear. for those of us because we're not insurance Absolutely. people and we appreciate you uh, doing that this morning. Um, well, this no, is what we have, we, we like to do. Why we need this to have it in a workshop. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, it well, don't bring it in. Well, it used to be this way years ago. Yeah, so we used to do this a lot, and but this I, is how we I, prefer I to do it. I like when this. I think because typically when we brought it, it was with uh, <coughs> yeah, health insurance. Right. So it was an entire, it was a piece just about insurance. Yeah. 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 We didn't have but that I health think health because we didn't have the insurance, because that was the, mm -hmm. the, the most, um, Looked at. Yeah. Um, this was typically, you know, brought. And and it was almost. When right. I like first got on the board, it was just property and casualty insurance. Oh, really? okay. And we would meet in Fleming yeah. Island's mm -hmm. library. Yes. Well, <laughs> and we had a meeting every year. And then the we workshop. had a workshop followed by a special meeting where Correct. we voted right. on it. Correct. Right. I'm going to tell you, I and like. And then it stopped. I like being in here because I feel like we're sitting around the table yes. and uh, that we're yeah. able to yeah. hear. Right. I feel like uh, it's a real workshop. Rather than yes. sitting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, I'd rather, so uh, so quick, I think this is good because it gives us a chance to really 
get into this and get some comments and some feedback yeah, from staff. Absolutely. Well, we ahead. appreciate yeah. the opportunity to do it. Okay. M Madam Chair, yes. may I? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, we're through with this, yes. but uh, Mr. Daggett, uh, uh, yes. Okay, uh, so there a kind of uh, dovetailing with that sentiment, okay, I had distributed way back when, probably November, uh, risk management policy, proposed risk management policy, uh, talked to you all right. about that, and I think it really does kind of parlay with all of this, mm -hmm. gets us back to maybe where you once were, okay, uh, where at least someone from this board is always kind of tuned in, has a place at the table for uh, risk management uh, claims committee issues that we can actually have entirely off the record. There are exemptions and exceptions that we ought to take advantage of. So I'm going to redistribute these by email. There are two models I stole. Okay, one is from Pinellas, one is from Bay. I'm not married personally to either one of them. They're really for this board's uh, consideration, and I figured I would just tee it up again while we're talking about it. Also, Ms. Condon, with respect to the SSOs, you know, you had mentioned what does our policy look like at the, I think, at the last uh, right. meeting. Yes. Right, yes. the weapons policy. Right, mm -hmm. so I have uh, drafted up proposed revisions on that that I'll distribute to you all by email. Um, just for your consideration, perhaps discussion, uh, of course, no, no decision making um, uh, need to be made on either one of these at our next meeting. I just wanted to kind of reference those. And then in, you know, tandem with the policy, um, whatever uh, the board chair or the board wants to do with the statement, remember there's that statement that was issued in April of 2018 while we were all trying to figure out what statement. are we gonna do? The, the school board statement. What was our statement? Uh, regarding the possession of firearms on school property. Oh, gotcha. Basically okay. you were uh, saying in this statement that was made part of the minutes, you kind of doubled down on uh, your 2.36 policy. And of course, all those things now, now need to change. I just figured I'd bring that up now and hope that uh, we can set our next uh, policy review workshop. I know how everyone is so excited to do that, <laughs> but I figured I'd just throw that out there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you already I already sent us the risk management one, right? Yes. Okay. Did okay. you send us both copies, both versions? Yes. Well, you're mm -hmm. going to send I'll them send again. I'll send them again. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have not really had conversation, but I uh, think that the board, uh, in looking at our calendar, other than uh, our board meeting for July that is held at the end of June, uh, it looks like we have a free month. And who, we what do we got in July? July 23rd, the tentative budget oh, yes. to be advertised. Okay, I've got that. But, and a public but hearing at 501 on the 31st. 501. But um, <laughs> we, pretty, we pretty much have yes. some free <coughs> weeks. And uh, I'm just thinking that they're not going to want to jump into the HR, which is our next segment is, mm -hmm. uh, in July. So we we. We can September. do it at the end of July if y'all want to, or we could wait. What ta What's the first day of school? The 14th. 14th of August, Tuesday. Right. If y'all wanted to do it the first part of August, or we could go ahead and do it last week in July. What's your pleasure? On uh, July 30th. I no, said July 31st, September. you would have that, like you said, that we're, we have campaigns to run. Well, you know, oh, they, oh, we've got, we, we do have three board members of the re-election in August. When's the press? We do have a, which is well, a, an agenda review day, so we need to change that. The one? So I don't know about you guys, but August 28th is election day, and we are set oh, for yes. an agenda yeah, review. Yeah, oh, so that. we need to switch that to that different days. Uh, sure, I'll all be well, smiling I, and waving somewhere. Wait the day after versus the well, what, day You're before. talking about August 28th is the election day? Okay. You're talking it's the day Tuesday. before? Isn't that a Tuesday? Isn't that a Tuesday? It's the primary day. Well, okay. Don't we normally do our agenda review on, on a Tuesday? Yeah. No, we always do it on Tuesday. Don't we do agenda review on Monday? No. Sometimes we have done it on Monday. So let's switch it to Monday. We did one. Because we leave here to go to Rotary. No. Go to What about? No, we leave here to go to Rotary. What about, what about, just a thought. All right. The agenda, we can't move it. We don't have, we have an August meeting. No. 
21st would be too early. Yeah, our staff that don't have anything ready. That's what yeah, I was just thinking. Well, that's way too just early. move it to Monday the 27th. Or you could push it to after. Um, well, July 26th. What are you talking about? August 27th, have the agenda review for the September meeting. It's a Monday morning, and it'll be just one day earlier, which is what we did last month. We did it on a Monday you guys just last week. What? Are not going to be waving signs or doing anything yeah, on Monday morning? Not Monday morning. Monday's fine. I was going to say, well, okay. I, what about the 30th? I would, go, I would go later in the week. <coughs> I'm just thinking. That's the day we have to publish it. So if there's any changes or anything that has to take place, right. we can't do that to Mrs. Bush and, and to staff. It has to, it it has to be, be Monday or Tuesday. Because our meeting would be the 6th. Is there a what reason the you guys can't do Monday the 27th? No. no. I'm then let's do. Of you guys. I can do it. Well, we can do it at the time of the day because if y'all are going to be waiting Sunday That'll be the day before the election, anyway. you'll do it early in the yeah. morning and late in the afternoon. Do it so we could do it. Just come in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we could do it. We There's could no do it. mentor. Well, we could skip mentoring that day. Would y'all? Well, no. Oh, excuse me. Oh, do you start oh, mentoring that early? We don't normally anyway. the first one. Yeah, yeah. I think we this would be the third one. Well, what time? If we met on the 27th, if y'all want to oh. do your sign mm -hmm. waving on the corners. <coughs> oh, I mean, isn't it nice? Isn't it nice? <laughs> okay, wait a second. No idea. I remember waving for both of you. Mary and I are up this time. We did this two years ago. And I don't usually bring this up, but we won last Friday. Oh, he didn't get a opponent. Well, congratulations. Thank you. That's the way to run the race. The races I've had with no opponent are a lot more Why don't we go to 9.30 on the 27th? They're not less interesting. Now, if y'all wait signs, what time are we going to 9.30? She's checking her calendar. If y'all wait signs, if you're waiting signs morning and afternoon, how soon could you get down here? Let me back in. After the election. I don't think we're going to want to get up right out of here. Right it's going to be a late night. I really don't want to do it that next morning. I would rather Monday. I think 9.30, 10 o'clock. How about 10 o'clock sounds perfect. All right. Go once. Go twice. Wait a minute. We'll wait for me. I think I am. We're going to schedule for 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock on the 27th. You can kind of wave sign. You can come in your sign. Well, I don't know. Can you wear a campaign shirt to a board meeting? Just turn the shirt in another t shirt. Bring another t shirt. Turn your shirt in. Policy that says we cannot. Turn your shirt inside out. I think actually stay lost. Right. 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 I request that y'all just don't wear your campaign shirt to the meeting. I don't want any lawsuits. All right. 10 o'clock. Campaign on public money. Oh, okay. 10 o'clock. This is August 27th. August 27th. Yep. This is our agenda review. Okay. And all right. So then, before that, do you want to set a time for a workshop? Because our next section is HR. Let's start. Let's just September. do it in September. Yeah. You want to wait for <laughs> September? September. They want to wait till September. It's not going anywhere. We'll pick up that conversation <laughs> August 27th. All right. No, that sounds like a good idea. September is going to get slammed. September. We're, what school starts, y'all? No, <laughs> that's okay. We can squeeze that in. We, they As they are kids trying their best to have yeah. July and August to be out walking door to door, right. begging people for votes. I understand. They do not want to do anything until after the election. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, Done. any of the, if there's nothing else to come before the board, the meeting is adjourned. Awesome. Very good.